Matthews and Isaac are two American soldiers in Iraq. They're now at a construction site where something went very wrong. As part of the security detail requested by the workers, we can see they got there too late. Now they suspect this was the work of a sniper, who may still be hiding behind a partially destroyed wall. After 20 hours under the relentless sun, Matthews says they should go. The US already declared victory and the war is over, so it makes no sense that an Iraqi soldier would stick around for that long. Isaac is not so sure. He finds it weird that the victims scattered in front of them don't seem to be near any kind of cover. That can only mean they've been taken down really fast. Matthews agrees to wait a little longer, but his patience doesn't last much. He decides to go down there to see what they can salvage before they get out of this hellish place. Isaac still thinks that wall is cursed, but he's running out of logic arguments, so he agrees to cover for him. Once he gets to move a bit, Matthews is in such a good mood that he's fully convinced it was all a false alarm. He even does a little dance and Isaac starts to sing a pop song. Then Isaac says there's something wrong with his scope. It's all fogged up and the images are getting blurred. Matthew says that this thing is a piece of junk and he should have tossed it long ago. It was Dean's anyway and it's bad luck to carry stuff that belonged to the dead. Crossing the construction site, Matthew sounds less and less smug about Isaac's theories. As he gets closer to the victims, he can see they've been hit with extreme precision. These people are starting to look like a warning, as if they've been in his shoes recently. Scoffing at the idea that such a legendary sniper could exist. He finally admits Isaac was right, but it's too late. While trying to determine where the shots came from, Matthews gets hit. Isaac grabs his gear in a panic and runs to help him, but ends up getting hit too. He limps towards that wall he'd been watching and takes cover behind it. Over comms, Matthews apologizes for his previous arrogance and groans in pain. He says something about his little brother and some money he should know about. Isaac won't hear any of that. While putting his leg in a tourniquet, he tells Matthews to do the same. He then tries to use the radio and requests their extraction. He gets nothing but static. It seems that the radio's antenna got hit. When Matthews hears that, all hope is gone. He tells Isaac he might have a shot and he wants to go for it. At least it won't have been for nothing. Isaac begs him not to because the second he gets off the ground, he'll be done for. They don't stand a chance against this guy. Once again, Matthews ignores him. He starts to calculate the distance based on the sounds of the gunshots and how long they took to hit the target. Realizing there's no use in arguing, Isaac decides to help him. He starts to remove some of the loose bricks off that wall so he can fit Dean's scope there. But he must be careful because that wall has obviously seen better days and it's about to collapse. If that happens, there will be nothing between himself and the sniper. He hurts his hand in that process but manages to get the scope where it must be. But before he can be useful, he needs to dress his wound. Unfortunately, that also involves the painful task of extracting the bullets. He manages to do that using his knife, but the pain makes him pass out. A voice coming from the earpiece that fell off wakes him up. Startled by the unexpected contact, Isaac begins to spit out their identification. He's so happy he calls Matthews by his first name, Shane and says they're going home. You can see poor Isaac hasn't watched many movies. As Matthews hasn't been responding for a while, Isaac informs about a possible casualty. He asks to confirm his ID, and then they say medevac is on its way. Isaac takes a moment to analyze the bullet a bit closer, and then repeats that there's a shooter with a high caliber weapon. To his surprise, he's now asked to say his challenge code. Isaac is getting suspicious about this guy over comms, especially when the man asks him to stand up and fire into the air so they can get a lot on his position. Isaac points out how stupid that would be considering there's a sniper also very interested in the same information. As the conversation gets fast and heated, the man slips on his accent. Isaac realizes he's been talking to an Iraqi all this time. Caught red-handed, the man admits he's been hiding behind his words just like Isaac is hiding behind that wall. So it turns out it's not just an Iraqi soldier, it's the sniper himself. Isaac begins to address him with a colorful vocabulary. He tries the radio again, requesting medical and a UAV, but nobody's listening. The man is still talking to his earpiece, asking about Matthew's family and whether or not he should finish him off. Then he says they should get to know each other. After all, it's only the two of them out there. Isaac plays along but says he won't go first. The man agrees and says he's just a regular Iraqi civilian. Isaac doubts that very much. He keeps talking while he tries to get back to Matthew's first plan and calculate the bullet trajectory to pinpoint his enemy's location. The man asks him if he's an army ranger or a marine. That familiarity seems to hurt Isaac's feelings. He begins a rant in defense of his country. These American guys at the construction site were here to rebuild Iraq. 
They were building pipelines to help their economy so they too could have great infrastructure, schools, freedom, and all that bag of goodies. The war is over now. The man disagrees with that. He says it's far from over, at least for Isaac. From his calculations, Isaac can see he should try and move closer to the part of the wall that once was a door. He's shocked to hear the man saying that this may be just bad luck from having carried Dean's scope around. Those are Matthew's almost exact words earlier today, so this guy had been listening to them all along. Now he wants to hear about Isaac's friends in the army, and he uses Matthew's to get what he wants, threatening to finish the job in a way that would call for a closed casket. And he's telling the truth. As we can still see, Matthews through the sniper scope. A crow has just stopped by to keep him company. Lying next to his face is his own earpiece, and the sniper's voice is coming from it as well. If he's still alive, he can hear Isaac agree to the bizarre Q&A in the hope to spare him. He talks about the other soldiers and that they play ball in the afternoon. But of course, the sniper won't let him get away with that nonsense. He seems obsessed with Dean for some reason, claiming to have a fascination by the brotherly bond between American soldiers. As Isaac refuses to talk to him, he tries a different different mind game. He says he never missed him. Isaac's knee, his water bottle, and the radio antenna were the actual targets. Now Isaac is badly wounded, dehydrated, and isolated. Isaac refuses to believe anyone is that accurate, but the results he described are actually happening. He feels weak and lightheaded, while the man goes on about that wall and how it used to be a school. That's when Isaac notices a distinctive sound of clanging metal. Getting back to the scope and chalking a few more calculations, he now thinks the sniper is hiding in the pile of trash. Maybe he was right since the beginning. This guy is Juba, the ghost sniper who claimed 75 US casualties and is called the Angel of Death. The man seems offended to be called a terrorist and says that from where he sits, the Americans are the ones bringing terror everywhere they go. Isaac says the US military trained them only to be betrayed. Juba asks him if it's acceptable to fire back when your friend fires at you. Isaac can't even pretend he's still following. In fact, he's in such a pitiful state, he gives up resisting the deep talk. He says he's from around the same area as Dean. He knows his family and his kids. His wife Clementine works at a shop. He keeps talking about Dean's family and his own, but not in an nostalgic way. He admits he can't go back to that life. He can't stand those people looking at him because they could actually see him. He seems to get a bit more awake every time he has a new idea. This time, he dressed up the rifle as a soldier and lifted it past the top of the wall. He's hoping the sniper will shoot the dummy and reveal his position, but we can hear Juba laughing at that pathetic attempt. <laughs> Sometime later, Isaac hops out of the missing door unexpectedly. There's no time to take him down before he takes cover again. Now, near one of the first victims, he grabs some of their stuff and hurries back to behind the wall. This time, Juba fires at him, and he keeps firing in the same direction until parts of the wall come tumbling down. Sitting by the patch of wall that looks stronger, Isaac gets to have a sip of water and some skittles. The gunshots start again. Now, aimed at the other side, some of the wall collapses there too. And then, the sniper starts to call his name in a worried tone that's probably half mockery and half the actual realization that he'll be alone once he succeeds. When Isaac finally responds, the man starts to recite the poem, The Raven. He's clearly much more educated than Isaac and even Matthews. Isaac admits he never heard of Edgar Allan Poe, but right now his attention is grabbed by something else. The transmission seems to be breaking up, and the only other person within range of that local radio is Matthews. Slowly coming back to life, he uses a mirror to communicate the resurrection. Isaac is over the moon now. They can't talk to each other over the radio anymore, but Juba is not at yelling distance. So Isaac shouts to Matthews that he knew it was just a nap and tells him the sniper is in the trash heap. While Matthews begins a slow movement towards his weapon, Isaac pretends a sudden interest in the sniper's literary taste, but Juba is strangely silent now. Isaac begins to worry about that and keeps talking about poems and authors. When he mentions Shakespeare for the second time, Juba just can't help himself and asks if that's the only writer he can name. Now, he seems to have bitten the bait and finally says something about himself. He used to teach English in Baghdad until a bomb destroyed the school. His scars from that day are an eternal reminder of the kids he lost. Completely ignoring that story, Isaac keeps shouting motivational stuff in Matthew's direction, urging him to keep up what he's doing. He's too hurt to move fast anyway, but the main point is to avoid attracting unwanted attention. The sniper sees him as a carcass now, and they want to keep it that way. So Isaac feeds him another cookie of personal history. He tells him about Captain Albright, the man who trained both Dean and him. 
He's the one who'll be looking for them in no time, and that will be the end of Sniper Poet. Not sounding very scared, Juba dangerously returns to the topic of Matthews, so Isaac shouts a warning, telling him to hold still for now. He decides to give the man what he seems to want and tells him it was his fault that Dean got hit. He didn't see the sniper who took him down. Matthews is not holding still, as he was told. Worried about him, Isaac shouts, slower man, slower, and to his complete horror, the sniper replies, slower what? He didn't realize it. He was still speaking over comms. The man repeats the question and demands to know who he's talking to. Isaac says he's talking to God, and then he fires all his ammo into the air as a distraction. Juba's reaction is immediate, and his bullets start knocking out more bricks. Matthews takes the opportunity and shoots the trash heap several times. There's a moment of total silence. Isaac asks if he got the sniper, and the answer comes swiftly in the form of one more bullet. Matthews gets hit again. Isaac screams in despair and begs Juba to let his friend go. His arm is injured and he's no longer a threat. At the edge of the wall, Isaac encourages Matthews to keep crawling to him. He says he's doing great and is almost there. That may be true, but at this point, even Isaac knows it means nothing. Juba is only waiting until their hope is almost at sea level, so he can drown it again. One shot is heard and Matthew stops moving. He's become one of those people scattered over the construction site, just like he feared hours before. In tears, Isaac asks why. Juba answers that with another question. He wants to know why he's still here. The war is over. Why is he so afraid to go home? Now Isaac breaks down completely. He tells him the truth about Dean. He was accidentally hit by friendly fire from Isaac, and absolutely no one knows about it because he lied to everyone, everyone but Juba. Now that he's opened his heart, it seems that his therapist dozed off. Isaac feels something is wrong and tries the radio again. There's a glimmer of hope when he hears Captain Albright calling his name, but that's soon smashed into pieces because someone else answers. Juba is impersonating him and even using some expressions he learned from him just now. Asking Albright for medical attention, he says the sniper's gone and Matthews is stable. Isaac finally realizes he's been playing the enemy's game all along. He came down here because the construction guys requested a security detail, but when that happened, the actual construction guys were already gone. Juba called Albright as soon as he had that name. That whole charade about getting to know him was not just a mind game. That's his MO for information he can use to lure more and more people into his scope. That's too much for Isaac and he blacks out. His alarm clock is that friendly crow checking for a snack. Helicopter blades can be heard at a distance, but he can't see anything yet. Improvising a fishing rod of sorts, he gets Matthew's rifle, revealing his position is not a concern anymore. Not when the choppers are coming and he's about to have more skeletons in his closet. So he knocks down the entire wall. Through Juba's sniper scope, the dust cloud is blocking the view. That makes him miss two shots. Isaac takes the opportunity and fires back. Then he stands up and closes his eyes, waiting for the end to come. But what comes instead is a group of rangers to rescue him. He's taken to the helicopter and receives medical care. And then he hears that dreadful sound again. The paramedics fall one by one while he tries to tell them the sniper is in the trash. By the time the pilot realizes they're under fire, it's too late. The chopper never makes it to their destination. So it's not long before Baghdad Command starts to radio them. They're calling for Bulldog 17. And then we hear Juba's voice responding. This is Bulldog 17. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 2017 movie The Wall by Amazon Studios, starring John Cena and Aaron Taylor Johnson. So what do you think they could have done in a different way? What was their biggest mistake? Let us know in the comments below with hashtag cinema recap. Until next time.